Hey, this is Josh Tipold again from Integrating Presence, back with Randy Green for part two of our first series, which I may call Trauma, Teaching, and Textural Interpretations. And I know at the beginning we talked a little bit about Dukkha, and we said we we're going to talk more about it. Uh, so here's what we're, we're back here, and we might say a few things we said in the beginning. But if you haven't listened to the first part, definitely go back and do that. Kind of lots of um, things along the lines of the titles. Um, and so I think a, 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 maybe a place to, to start with this is, well, first off, what is dukkha uh, and why is it, why is it important? Um, I'll say another caveat here that it really is not designed to be taken out of context with the other four noble truths. So the first noble truth of the Buddha is the, the, tr- the noble truth of dukkha. And, uh, well, well, what is dukkha? And some of the most common ways that people can just jump into it as is interpreted in English is suffering. But, you know, it, we think of suffering as really extreme. Like if somebody say, oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're suffering or there's, you know, but people say, no, that's I'm not suffering, you know. So this is uh, I mean, I might suffer a few times in my life, but that seems really extreme word. So. Stress is another interpretation of dukkha, and unsatisfactoriness is really a good one because who doesn't experience unsatisfactoriness from day to day? Um, and you know the the Buddha said he taught two things: um, the suffering and the end of suffering, or one thing even. Sometimes it said, "I just teach suffering and the end of suffering." So why is this important? You know, have this um, fully enlightened being uh, said. And he knew all this stuff, uh, all these other things, but he would only teach suffering and the end of suffering, which I'll just go really briefly through um, the other noble truth. So the second noble truth is the the noble truth of the cause of suffering. And then the third noble truth is the, um, the, the noble truth of the cessation or ending of suffering. And then the fourth noble truth is the path or the way out or the way towards the cessation of suffering. But today we're going to drill down more on just the first one. And I know a bunch of people say, oh, these Buddhists, they're just such party poopers. You know, they're always talking about suffering. I mean, come on, give it a break. So um, I, I want to just talk about why this is important to begin with. You know, why are we spending time on this um, before we jump in? And I uh, will... First, say welcome back, Randy. And then if you want to jump in here with why is this important uh, or any other approach you want to take immediately on this. Yeah, no, I'll mm-hmm. let you give the background here. So, okay. yes. All right. Well, that's that's um, a lot of the different uh, the background. Well, there, there's, a, there's a few more things I might say. Now, um, uh, the, you know, the Buddha, he didn't. I mean, this this is the kind of a, a core teaching in Buddhism, I would say. And even if there's other schools and sects that, you know, which we, who knows, we might look at another a text on um, later on in this this podcast. We might not. But for, for the most part, at least all the Buddhist schools at least acknowledge the Four Noble Truths, whether they think that suffering ultimately exists or not. But that's another uh, good distinction here. So we'll be talking about the relative reality of this, not the ultimate level of reality. So there's this notion of the two truths, which isn't an original teaching. It's a later distinction from my understanding that we're talking about there's a relative truth and an ultimate truth or a relative reality and an ultimate reality. So of course, we're not going to go into the ultimate reality of this. We'll probably just be addressing it mostly from a relative reality, right? And also a very practical, the Buddha was known as a, a pragmatist, right? As well as a humanist that all these things were visible here and now, you know, in addition to being realized um, by each one for their own, um, you know, realized by the um, each wise one for their own. So it's not like some theoretical thing. You know, we can look at this in our everyday lives. It does. It's not just like a scholarly exercise, right? That um, there is unsatisfactoriness and stress in life. And a lot of times, I know from my own experience, one of the ways it comes from is this false notion I have that if I could just get all my external conditions lined up just right, have everything the way I want it, then, you know, then things will go good. You know, I'll have total control over everything and just 
keep everything arranged and then, you know, I'll just be happy that way. Hmm. The, the thing is, though, that that is not a long term, in my experience anyway, that's not a long term plan for suffering because eventually in the long term, I will not be able to keep all the external conditions the, the way I want them, right? Something will come along and then it will throw that off. And then when I expect that it shouldn't be like that, well, then I will get upset because, um, because you know, it's not going the way I wanted it to externally. And so then I can get uh, upset and frustrated and just feel like uh, things are crappy. It shouldn't be like this. So then I'm at that point, then I'm laying overlaying uh, an additional layer of um, suffering on top of the pain that's already there. So there's like maybe a psychic pain that's already there, but then I make it, it, this is the teaching of the two arrows, right? The, the human incarnation, nobody experiences being human without some kind of pain, but the one that's more avoidable instead of hitting ourselves with the second arrow is saying this, this wisdom of, well, um, when I say it shouldn't be there, it shouldn't be like this. Um, I, I can't, I don't want this to be like that. And so that's just, for me, that's an other layer that doesn't need to be there because it's adding psychological pain on top of how painful it already is. Hmm. So that's, mm-hmm. that's to jump in there. Sure. That's very similar to when we talk in psychology, when mm-hmm. we talk about therapy, when we talk mm-hmm. about, we have the incident or the, the situation, mm-hmm. but how we interpret it, the way, what we derive from it, the way we respond to it is all about the narrative we create around the situation as in, in, in this is, if we and people say, is it similar to the the, the glass half full or the, the half empty? Mm-hmm. It depends on the approach. And I would say, no, that's not it. That's kind of glossing it over. Uh, even though you put lip gloss on a, a pig, it's still a pig. Yeah. So so there are certain we can't weasel our way around <laughs> using a lot of animal analogies mm-hmm. here. We can't weasel our way around the incident, mm-hmm. but we can we can begin to work with the pain of it as in kind of yeah, I fell in and I hit my knee. That's physical pain but you can also have the emotional pain yes. that that goes with why did you fell and, and hit your knee if someone pushed you then you will have the emotional pain of it because that was unfair why did that person push me and when we have then we can choose to go into anger or we can choose to go into to resentment or we can mm-hmm. choose to go into victimization and blaming ourselves i'm a bad person for falling in i should have never done that if I or if the yeah. other one or the person pushed us then mm-hmm. it's karma or it's punishment or the mm-hmm. gods are against me mm-hmm. or i deserve this so mm-hmm. that's where the narrative comes in as mm-hmm. in exploring all of these avenues not just locking into one but psychologically and emotionally and and energetically Mm -hmm. go in and say okay that might actually be the truth not the truth but the case sure because what is truth it Mm -hmm. might actually be the case yes i might have done something in a previous lifetime that actually alludes or builds up to this moment where i have a re-experience of something i have unfinished business with or we could go from a a normal psychological perspective looking into okay that other person, what was he or she? Is it a perpetrator? Is it a kind of a predator? Or is it incidentally something that happened by accident? So we can't say if it's done by by um, directly, volu- what you call it, by... Um, intent with intent with to in, harm. thank yeah. you mm-hmm. intent to harm yes mm-hmm. then we can be upset and feel victimized and kind of why the fuck you do that to me kind of mm-hmm. and then we will have a different narrative than if we are just looking over and if we fall and we get pushed and we we think mm-hmm. that that person wants to do it deliberately and then we we move around and and we're full of aggression and why do you do that yeah. instead just go into the mindfulness approach where we stop up for a moment and look at that person and then person will say oh i'm so sorry i didn't mean to do so so, and then we say, well, then that person was an instrument for the gods to to reimburse or re put back in the, the, whatever I haven't paid. We can call all of these narratives mm-hmm. and just there, just calm down, stop all of that frustration, yeah. and just look in the now and say, this this happened. Mm-hmm. This is an experience. Mm-hmm. This is what that person is. This is what I am. And then and here I want to put in some of the things you're working with a lot. That's where loving kindness come in. Because there you go into that mode of, if it is a past life reenactment, mm-hmm. if it is a predator, mm-hmm. all depending on what kind of predator it is, but if it's kind of a manifestation of ill will, to put it that way, mm-hmm. into this reality, 
then all of these things can actually be eradicated and, and cease to be frustration and this fire of indignation and turn into a fire of transformation where we, we look at the situation and f- instead of feeling hatred and ill-mindedness ourselves, we go and feel this kindness in ourselves and in the situation. We might not be able to change the predator, but we can at least change how we respond to it, what the narrative will be around it. So instead of choosing something that re-traumatizes us and lingers on in that pain that will then eventually, if we do believe in karma, will become a physical pain later on from being an emotional pain and will later on become a physical pain in an, another life, then we can go in and say, well, right here and now I heal that pain by choosing to be in compassion, by choosing to be in that feeling of here I heal it right here and right now and by that I bring it to its cessation. I stop it right here and now instead of following the trail of frustration that will lead to rebirth. Yes. It's, Sorry for just bringing it right up there. No, <laughs> that, that's real. It, it's there. There's so much to pick up on. This is really good. So you know, this this natural human ec- inclination to explain things, to derive meaning from events, and I think that's there. It's very helpful to do that. And at the same time, I also feel it's 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 helpful to have the ability of just saying being okay with not knowing what it is, mm-hmm. but how we view it. So. That's the first step of the Eightfold Noble Path is right view or correct view or wise view or whole view. Uh, and so that's kind of where wisdom starts and ends to, to view something in the in the best possible manner, right? That that's going to lead towards benefit and at the same time is not deceiving ourselves or lying to ourselves at the same time, right? So you almost have to have um, some degree of, of wise view in order to, to become more wise. And then wisdom will lead to even better, more more, um, I guess not evolved, but yeah, I guess uh, more skillful views on how to see things. So that that's the one thing we definitely can have a, a seeming choice over is how we view a situation, how we respond to it. Mm-hmm. Now there's all kinds of possibilities on that way. Yeah. You illustrated some beautiful ways to do that too. But now, I, th- mm-hmm. I think I think sure. a little bit of the key word here mm-hmm. is in, in my opinion and my experience and yeah. what I remember, not what I've studied because I sure. haven't studied Buddhism to, sure. to the letter as you have to mm-hmm. a large degree but for me when we talk about frustration and the cessation of dukkha as in in this pain frustration aggression way of interpretation yes. things clinging on to things yes. creating situations for ourselves that makes things more complicated it has a lot of meaning all depending on yes. where it could be physical pain it can be emotional pain it can be mental constructions that leads to pain yes. because we think of things in a specific way that makes us what we call a cognitive scheme when we talk about depression there the mind creates what cognitive scheme or a cognitive schemata where you begin in one end and then it goes into a spiral where you end up being depressed and sad and if you can via the cognitive therapy techniques you can go in and stop that spiral Mm -hmm. so that's mindfulness that's also meditation and mindfulness where you go and observe what's happening in my mind and with the emotional level what's happening emotionally in my heart when i experience this situation and what's happening on the physical level Mm -hmm. so the pain is we we know some of the practitioners that are the gurus and some of the other ones that work with the physical form they can completely Mm -hmm. distinguish all forms of pain Mm -hmm. so they don't feel pain and we know the that we can do our painkillers and what have you. So pain is also tied to our expectation of pain or our expectation as we have learned when we're children Mm -hmm. that if we fall and our mom said, oh, go that way, then pain will be something very to to be afraid of. Whereas if we are... We, we kind of, when we fall and we get picked up, we get kissed on the cheek and mom says, it's okay, it's fine, it's fine, it's just pain, you can deal with this, it's good. You feel it, this is to teach you to be careful next time or put it into some kind of context that is expanding our awareness of how to use our body in a proper way because that's what pain is. Then we create the narrative around it as in, in this is not just something to be afraid of but actually something to utilize in, in- Yes. For a better way of being a human being. And that narrative is more the distinction I'm drawing between pain and and, and uh, the stuff we add on top of the natural pain. Now, the childhood thing I'm going to set aside because that's a whole new complex thing. But <laughs> maybe an example I'll give is that... Uh, yeah, it's the stories we tell about our, what, you know, the extra stories we add on. Like if we have a physical a physical pain or something like that, and then some people might add on like, oh, well, I'm, I'm, 
the, the stories added on top of that, you know, mm -hmm. because there's some stories that we add on top of that. Well, that actually add an extra level mm -hmm. of uh, unsatisfactoriness to it. But there's other views and stories we can we can see that might actually help it more wise more wisdom or wise views or skillful ways to, to, to um, view it that will that won't add that extra level yeah. of unsatisfactoriness on it. Now the um, what was the so young yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just thinking what we're dealing with here and what we're doing here and trying to exemplify here is that when when we are having this discussion on on words which some scholars do and yes, some yeah. do not do and is it to be interpreted this way or that sure. way or whatever then in my mind mm -hmm. we must understand because the buddha was one of the the people that could look into different realms and mm -hmm. different aspects of things in one go mm -hmm. uh, very similar i'm not saying i'm a buddha or anything mm -hmm. but my i've trained my mind to do some of the same things and others that practice and expand their awareness mm -hmm they can look into multiple layers at the same time. And that's why we begin to understand why we cannot take words literally, why we must always work with them on the different levels. Yes. This is the physical, this is the emotional, sure. this is the mental, this is the extraordinary onto the other realms. As well as when, when the Buddha was teaching the layman, he would use the analogy of the yoke of, of the bull, for instance, that living inside the human realm, in if we do contextual as in the time of his existence, the ones he would be teaching were slaves. And they were under enslavement and they were slaving for someone else. So they were under a yoke both meaning that they were carrying the burden of the rich people, but they were also carrying the burden of being the low caste. They were also carrying the burden of pain. They were also carrying the burden of psychologically not being acknowledged as living beings. Yes, and also round after round of birth and samsara, right? Yes. So, and in that interpretation, have I got to this bottom of the hierarchy because I have done something ill-minded in my previous lifetime? Is this the punishment from the gods mm -hmm. to put me here? And then... Then the Buddha came into this whole teaching, another level of teaching, which we have also discussed, you and I, mm -hmm. where they, they go in and where he goes in and say, well, none of the gods are eternal beings. They are, they are also having their, let's put it the transgression rate, they will also cease to exist at some point. So there is no living being that's internal. There is no continued repetition and, and rebirth after rebirth after rebirth, since everything will come to an end eventually. So let us go in and figure out, okay, what is it that leads to the rebirth? And that's where the understanding of Dukkha comes in, because that's where the teachings are. Well, you have that experience. And what you put onto it, what you tailor around it, the faculties of mind, what you interpret it, the faculties of emotion, what you put into the five scandals, what you put into the under. I'm sorry if, if I'm not. But it's, it's, it's yeah. interesting because it, it's uh, people. It's it, because there's actually a terminology in Buddhism called the five faculties, yeah. but they're um, they're also called the indriya. Yeah. And so it's interesting how we're kind of mixing ter our, these terms that Buddhists usually take as their own terminology. Yeah. So in, in the skandhas too, but uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm alluding to that because. I'm well, kind of trying it's, to tap into, thing. Yeah. yeah. And so the uh, the well, we, we, even if people don't, you know, there's no requirement for people that are, you know, not into this very deeply is to to um, buy into or believe mm. rebirth. But the thing is, past actions. So it just mm. goes to the this is, goes to the notion of actions have consequences, mm. according to some, like you you know, a cause and effect or thing like this. But so yeah, we you, the earlier examples you talked about. Well, maybe this is past a uh, fruit of a past action, mm. and so um, so that just kind of it. That's the way maybe to weasel out of uh, past lives. You just mm. say past action because sometimes things might happen in this lifetime, but some might be from prior mm. lifetimes too as well. Yeah. But I don't think mm -hmm. we can take the, the teachings of oh, the Buddha yeah. without having it in the context of the time he was living in. And yeah, the, absolutely. Yeah. He lived with people mm -hmm. in India that believed in past life and, and current well, life and, and future life. And that's life. part of it too. Reincarnation. Yeah, he talks and, about rebirth. And, yeah. and, that's, and, and he, for me, he mm -hmm. was, if I am to interpret it in my way, he was teaching people that this... This might be true to some point, not what he would have said. I would mm -hmm. rather go around. Mm -hmm. If we are to understand the, under, the, the, the concepts of Dukkha in, on its different levels, then he would teach one level to the slaves. Mm -hmm. 
as in a, a kind of explanation of why they were positioned where they were positioned, mm -hmm. as in mm -hmm. this is the life you have now, but it's not necessarily because the gods have deemed it that yeah, way. Exactly. It's not necessarily exactly. because yes. they are they Very are impermanent yes. creatures yes. as well. Exactly. So they don't rule over you as a human yeah. being. So what it all comes down to, it's not circumstances, it's yes. not the gods, it's not karma, yes. yeah. but it is your actions in yes. here and now, what right you're doing there. here yes. and now that determines yeah. whether or not you will be in the wheel of samsara, the wheel there of rebirth. Is, there is, you and hit for me, on the head, yeah. Yes, and for me, that's the understanding yes. of Dukkha, where he yeah. goes in and teaches people and say, well, this, this is your own doing, so to speak. Yeah. If you change the way yes. you experience life, if you change the way you experience your life as it is now, mm -hmm. yes, it sucks, he might not have said that, mm -hmm. but you can, you can well. change the way you perceive it, you can change yeah. the way the narrative you create around it, you can change the way you experience Experience these, mm -hmm. these physical mm -hmm. uh, uh, impermeable, and, and they are they're just things that happens mm -hmm. to your body. You can override it, which you learned by the gurus. Mm -hmm. You can override it. You can work with it in meditation, mm -hmm. contemplation. Yes, you come home. The, the, you have been beaten up. You have been whatever has happened to you, but you can sit at the end of the day doing your, your, your before the, the sun goes down meditation and clear it all out and go into love and compassion and just heal yourself from that moment. Yep. Yes, you will wake up tomorrow, it'll be the same shit, but you could do that every day. Mm -hmm. And that will minimize the burden of distortion or that leads and to a specific type of rebirth. Yes, and, and they also talk, uh, Sila Samadhi Panya, so Sila is the ethics. So even the people that don't get a chance to do meditation right the, these ethical ways of conduct it's going to be of benefit too if you act you know skillfully usually you might have more of a chance to have a skillful result mm -hmm. so you know it's not because you thou shall not right is this is for your own wealth yeah. uh, welfare and yeah. long-term welfare and well-being then the next step is we're talking more about the the meditation path that that helps you can go another layer mm -hmm. and then the panya is the wisdom and that can really help us see and know and overcome levels of suffering towards mm -hmm. the, the complete uh yeah and i just i just yeah. wanted to go no. in would you go yeah. ahead no yeah. no go ahead please. no because yeah. what you said there mm -hmm. because if you go into the, the oh. circumstances of the layman that were slaves mm -hmm. They had no chance yeah, of changing their point. life, yeah. no chance whatsoever. They yeah. might as well have been thrown he, into a prison cell. Yeah. That's why he allowed the lower caste to join the order if they could even have that possibility. Yes, though. but the, yeah. if we look into that that mm -hmm. context and say, well, they had no chance of changing their lives, mm -hmm. what could they then change the way they perceived it? Absolutely, yep. So I think we should look at the, the yep. teachings, the Four Noble Truths, yep. as well in within that context. Yep. If we look within the context of the, the Rajas or the nobilities mm -hmm. and the rich people, yep. Then the teaching would apply in a different way. Yes. So we have to say, well, when we talk about the idea of dukkha, we have to who who is mm -hmm. working with frustration there? Yep. What level of frustration yeah, are we talking about? Yeah. But also, what are the life circumstances? Yes. And this is why it's a right view, and this is the very first step on the path. And it's mm -hmm. the you know yeah, yeah. And so like. I don't know all the exact terms, but I think it was defined as what, you know, what is uh, Duco? Birth, aging, sickness, death, uh, sorrow, grief, lamentation, despair. I think I'm missing all these things. So it's, it's the ending of that. So just know that it's not just all the bad things. There's a possibility it's said that, you know, there is a chance to end this. If it wasn't possible, I wouldn't teach it. So that's the third one. So we keep this in mind at the beginning, maybe middle and end that it's just not all party pooper time. Right. Um, um, all right. Now, then, actually, it's a little bit when we're going to talk about the Gospels and, and the sayings, sure. the happy, the Gospels, the, mm -hmm. it actually means the happy message, the happy news yes, that were brought. Yes, the good news. And, <laughs> and Jesus were also teaching the layman. He was also teaching the slaves. And St. Paul goes in and say, this is this is the liberation of enslavement where we get liberated in the corpus of Christ. Yes. So the idea is the same that we have these people that are targeting mm -hmm. that information for the ones that are enslaved. Mm -hmm. And I don't. And I that think language is used to liberation, emancipation. Exactly, from and I yep. think that's enormously yes. important. We can, of course, if we go scholar mm. nerdy here, that the the emancipation that mm. Jesus talked about were actually the Hebrews that left Egypt and that old enslavement and what have you. We could go tailing back to that once because that's a Jewish context. Mm -hmm. But here we have a, a, an Indian context. Mm -hmm. But they both on the Indian Indian continent as well as in in in, in Judea people were enslaved and they had no freedom 
And then we have these teachers that comes in and tells you, you can't change the circumstances because that is what it is, but you can change the way you perceive it. And then we can go and say, well, do we then go in and create the narrative of gods or reincarnation or whatever? And I think that why I do enjoy Buddhism very much to the degree I understand is because it is so close to psychology, it's so close to yeah. good human behavior, it's Absolutely. so close to these are the it techniques, is, is a how you can survive being in an environment that literally restrains yeah. you from A yeah. to Z, yeah. and how can you still have that balance point because i'm not going to say you create joy because that is impermeable as well that will the moment you have joy you might get kicked in the butt and life happens but there are moments of joy otherwise it wouldn't be tolerable at all yes but i would rather say points of neutrality where you are just in acceptance and trust and 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 just being in that without labeling it, without sure. valuing it, without putting things in mm-hmm. it, and just do what you have to do because then tomorrow is another day. Yep. As the gospel say, each each day has its own yep. burden. So you just, as a slave, because I want to put it there so sure, we have that sure. context, yes, yes. that as a slave of reality and what's mm-hmm. where the circumstances you put into, mm-hmm. it all depends on how you're working with these circumstances. Mm-hmm. And that can... As we're kind of saying, as you have the piece of cold that coal, coal yeah. mm-hmm. and that the more you pressure it, it will eventually become diamond. a diamond. And sure. that actually goes into some of the diamond body teachings, uh, where you sure. use all of that pressure, mm-hmm. which we can interpret as suffering. Yep. You take all of that pressure, mm-hmm. all of that dukkha, mm-hmm. and you transform it into becoming this enormously strong, sovereign, mm-hmm. independent being that no matter whatever happens to you, always stand in the midpoint, and you will always transform suffering, and you will always turn it into love and compassion and you will always find the center point Mm -hmm. that no matter what happens it will not really affect the core of who you are and that goes into the sukha where we talk about the non-essence what is the essence so and before we get there pick up on some point yeah that, that equanimity that that the wise some people it's not to be confused with indifference it's a really kind of wise grandparently love that saying that i cannot live your life for you you know i need to worry or not worry you know, maybe that comes into it too but the my my own kind of own or whatever level of stability in that while I can offer, you know, uh, help and guidance along the way, I can't do every single thing for you. You know, you have to do your, you go on your own path. And this whole notion of uh, enslavement is a really good one, both literally and figuratively, because, you know, um, just even the nobility would, would be enslaved to like, you know, I don't know, um, lots of different sense pleasures, having access to all kinds of things, right? Mm-hmm. And still even not having that be satisfactory, you know, and really, so it just whatever caste you were, you, there would still be some level of stress and unsatisfactory, it's just different degrees mm-hmm. in that view. And so there was a big emphasis with, you know, it might have been uh, fruits from past actions, but the thing is, like we were saying, Right now is the chance to change. You can view this. You have, There's the choice to view this a different way now. And there's a choice now to act, think, and speak more skillfully mm-hmm. and more wisely now, which will pay off. So instead of putting the emphasis on all, all the past and how horrible it was and maybe what I did all in the past, you know, not to deny that, but know that uh, that can actually drag one down even further if we give that more time and attention and energy, but know that now is the chance to make a change. Our actions, our thoughts, speech and action do make a difference. There's one thing though that I also wanted to pick up with is when we talked about um, the real life example of getting pushed down. And uh, yes, I think you kind of, um, um, also mention compassion because in my notion that would be a, a notion of compassion there because to say oh hey you know how you doing and when somebody's you know hitting you I don't you know it's not I mean that's a real high minded thing and I would say very advanced practitioners can do that but for the reality the street smart spirituality would my view is that person is in a lot what is that person going through that they did that you know mm-hmm. and also this notion of yeah, that person is a lot of freaking pain, right? Or something really bad is going on there. And at the same time, they want to be happy just like I want to be happy, yeah. right? You know, so now, now sometimes the compa- most compassionate thing to do is, you know, put up strong boundaries and stay just as far as away from that person as you possibly can mm-hmm. and, and have no interaction whatsoever. I think in some cases that is the most compassionate yeah. thing. It's not like I'm going out, you know, so... 
but it, mm-hmm. again, I put yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that's I would say that's people in the distance that kind of we don't look at yes. people in the distance because yeah. we're not infiltrating and we're not entangling ourselves yes. into their energy field. He would talk energy. Yes. But if if I have a person, mm-hmm. this is this is you talk about the higher levels of compassion. Mm-hmm. If if we if I have the situation where I'm on a train and and I am in my bubble of energy, I'm in my version of reality, the mm-hmm. relative reality that I have created by working with my energy system mm-hmm. to the level where I am in that balance point of neutrality so that whatever happens around me fluctuates in and out of my field without me clinging on to it, without me grasping yes. it, without me pulling it in and yes. saying, this is mine or this yes. is part of who I am, just letting it be there as an experience. Mm-hmm. Then if someone comes and pushes me, mm-hmm. then that person becomes part of my experience and by that com- becomes part of my field. Mm-hmm. And that's where I, when in that situation where I will then go into that still point and look at the situation and actually in that moment, I would be able via the, the higher levels uh, works of compassion, be able to change the trajectory of his, I'm using a he here, sure. his and my entanglement in future lifetimes. I can actually put, I can extinguish that karma that would arise from that moment by being in the correct type of compassion. And that has nothing to do with me being all softy and, yes. oh yeah, you didn't mean to do Very that. Good point. It is an energetic mm. nullification of the incident. Mm-hmm. So that's something entirely different. It is. Really that's in- mastery of energy field. Mm-hmm. So and that means compassion has different layers too. Absolutely. And this goes along with a view, because you saw all this and you know where it could potentially lead with your action, mm-hmm. right? And the action is more energetic in this case, but it's still the, 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 the what you saw, the view and where it could lead, and then the action, the response that, that was chosen there. So mm-hmm. it is a type, but it's it's again on a high you know, a different level. But yeah. 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 So that's beautiful. Yes, because if, if that situation is not resolved, mm-hmm. then it will we will meet up again at some point. Because mm-hmm. it's kind of you have this it's like a tear in the fabric of reality. Two realities clashes together. This is where we go into, we have relative reality. There's our individual reality that is ignited and controlled and explored and unfolded via our energy system. Mm-hmm. But if we go into the unified reality field, then all of these individual relative reality incidents mm-hmm. will create a pattern from where we will be forced to meet up eventually. And this goes to the notion that that maybe a similar type thing is when, if I don't learn a specific lesson, a specific (laughs) specific lesson, it it seems to keep repeating until I've mastered it or came to completion. It might not be the exact same person. It might uh, be in a different scenario in a different place, but the dynamics are really similar, right? These repeating things that happen in our life over and over again until we kind of get the, the thing that needs to be learned or realized. I yeah. mean, that's what came to mind with this, yeah. Yes, so that's the understanding also of karma as this pattern that we mm. are weaving together of reality, our relative reality, our individual perception of reality, the way we administer our energies and our consciousness potentials will then create the big pattern where we are all interconnected and that not that we are all at one or we are all one because we're not interconnected yes but we are interconnected and we are affecting each other interdependent too yes because we are in the same reality so in a in a way we say karma is the entire reality it's not just cause and effect Mm -hmm. but it has a cause and effect in our everyday Mm -hmm. life and it has a cause and effect on the long run Mm -hmm. And that's where you go in when you master the compassion to the high degree, mm-hmm. where you begin to understand it's, yes, you're both compassionate in the moment, but what is compassion in that moment? Compassion in that moment is to understand who's actually in front of you. What's the right course of action here? So that's another cause and effect. What's the right course of um, action here? Yes. Which we talk about the noble truth yes. of how to end dukkha. Yes. The course of action. What do you do here? Yes. What's the root and, and, of it, and yes. how do you work with it? And that's wisdom. Knowing what, uh, taking knowledge and applying it in everyday life. Yes. Right? Actually, putting knowledge into action. Yes. And then knowing it for yourself. You know. Yes, with yeah. the incident that's in front of you, exactly. and not just in contemplation, exactly. and not just in yep. meditation. It's an application. So, so you have to be out in life yes. to to really experience what how we put these teachings into effect in everyday life. Yep. yep. 
And that's the mindfulness for me comes in that in that moment, every single moment, you have to be completely mindful, yep. observant. You never have too much mindfulness. Yes, and always see every single incident that comes into your life. Once you get to the higher levels of the, the, the path where you begin to understand the whole life is this fluctuation of energies that changes and you're in this yep. ocean of all of these energies mm-hmm. and every single moment is a moment of wisdom, of learning, of processes, of transformation and where you can begin lives and end lives and, and develop lives and whatever you want to do with that moment, everything can be lifted up to an enormous uh, mm-hmm. unified level understanding of reality or just choose to do it locally. Yeah, and the, the I think the Buddha is an example of that, that that's possible, you know, at least this, the, what we have handed down. There's one thing you said there, though, that I was... Um, that I, uh, that I was wondering that I kind of missed that you said everything is karma in a way. Now, I, my understanding is that there are other laws that come into not everything is karma, right? Mm-hmm. And this goes into the bigger, uh, well, I mean, just like the, the laws that govern weather, weather, although we are, mm-hmm. some say, you know, connected and can affect, but there's, I guess, certain natural processes mm-hmm. that don't de- depend on our realms, action. The human see, realms. Yeah. So when we talk about mm-hmm. the human realms, this is, this is, but it's a, it's a good distinction, uh, distinction to make because people might not think in these different boxes. But yes. I was thinking when or talking about when we talk about the human realms yes. and talking about karma. Karma is yeah. only connected to human I existence. I see what you say. Because I was like the spin rate of an atom yeah. might not have to do with any of my actions. But then sometimes it depends on what if, those if, were. If, and if, atoms, be, yeah, so. if atoms even exist. But right, exactly. You <laughs> yes. know, yeah. So no, nature does not have karma. Nature is not an entity. Nature is not a life form as we understand yes. of it. So it, it does not get reborn. It can't reborn. do its own actions. Yes. Yeah, so right. it does yeah. not sure. get reborn. Sure. Okay. The planet so does not get yeah. reborn sure. into yeah. different shapes, sure. even sure. though the esoteric teachings allude to that yeah. one, because they want to make them entities, the logos sure. of the planet, what have you. But when we, from in my understanding, is that when we talk about the human realm, this is the human realm on its own. Because if we talk about the laws that governs universal structures, we go into a completely different discussion. Yes. Yes, exactly. So cause and effect here is always connected to rebirth, and karma is always connected to the understanding of existence. Mm-hmm. In different realms of reality, or as I call them, timelines or nodal points, and don't get me started on a whole other level of things. Yeah. But here we keep it within the concept of the Buddhist ideas. Sure, sure. And for me, karma there yes. is alluded to the actions of the past, yes. the actions of the present, and how you can change that yes. so you will not be caught up in the wheel of samsara. Yes. And, because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, Dukkha is to be stuck on the wheel of rebirth. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And that's what the ending of Dukkha is. You know, that's, a, that's what enlightenment and liberation is, the ending of Dukkha. What's being ceased? Dukkha, right? And it's a really important notion, too, that our actions matter because some systems say, oh, no, everything's predetermined, you know, it's, um, it's either fatalistic mm-hmm. or predeterminism, things like this, mm-hmm. you know, so that's really because then, then there's no incentive to behave in, in a way or do anything yeah. whatsoever i mean if nothing applies so yeah so that's that's another important thing now let's um the um the one thing we uh, talked about uh in the last one is this the 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 the, the well before I wanted to, mem- do you remember the point when I said I was going to go back and pick up some some things before mm-hmm. you kind of transitioned into something? Now I've completely I'm I'm, I'm off on that. So yeah. Yeah. maybe if it comes up later, we can we can choose that. But the one thing we left at the last time that it, we kind of um, hinted that we pick up is the symbol working mm-hmm. with the symbol. Yeah. So do, if we want to go back to that and explore that a little bit deeper and how that works. Well, let's see if we can work our way back in because yeah. that's a very, very high level. Right that's now, right. we have gone yeah. into the path of compassion yes, and karma yes. and the, uh-huh. the the cessation of being on the wheel of rebirth mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and being enslaved to the wheel yes. of rebirth. Because I think it's important when we talk about the Buddha and his teachings. Mm-hmm. He was always working with this very. I'm sorry, I'm saying he was always mm-hmm. as if I've been around him, but it's, it's, a, it's an English expression. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yes. So yeah. so the, the working with the different layers of information and teachings, and again, we have. Talk about from the slaves mm-hmm. and how to to be in a reality where you're stuck and you're 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 literally refrained from doing anything yes. and then going into to the kings and the abilities or whoever were on a higher caste mm-hmm. and what would they be enslaved by other than frustration and nitty-gritty yeah you got the whole palace there and and you're still complaining kind of psychology but what would they be actually enslaved by they would be enslaved by the gods 
they would adhere to the gods because they were put there as that level that would administer reality field for the gods. So in, in, in my vision I'm having here is that if the Buddha were teaching a, a king or a nobility or raja, he would then go in and say, your frustration is that you are linked up to the gods. You are controlled by the gods. Your wealth is controlled by the gods. You are technically not free either. You are also enslaved. You are enslaved by your greed. You are enslaved by your, your, your priesthood that you are asking them to cast the, 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 not the runes, but cast the, the, the fortune or whatever that is to look into the stars to look into astrology so you can get more fortune so you can get more wealth and that would also mean more power so you're enslaved by your power you're enslaved by your greed you're enslaved by and if you don't get that then you get frustrated you're enslaved by your thousand wives or whatever was going on so how do you stop having that that and that's why both when we talk about the gospels or the the teachings of jesus or the, the buddha as in yes you can teach this level to these people but at the end of the day it's they are more difficult actually to liberate than the commoners. Yep. And even expanding this uh, beyond, it said that the human realm is the best place for this type of practice because if, if one's in a hell realm, it, it's just too agonizing. Mm. You don't have any thought. You just have to wait till that lifetime's over. And then if it's in the heaven, everything's so delightful mm. and beautiful, you know, that there's no incentive. What is suffering? I mean, stress, what are you talking about? This is lovely, mm. you know? So there's no incentive in the extremes, mm. right? Yeah. To practice, but there's just enough here here to say, yeah, this just isn't doing it for me. You know, what's the better way here? So yeah. there's an incentive here on from the Rajas all the way to the, the, the slaves that, yeah, we all share this in common until we're fully mm. enlightened from my understanding is that we're all going to experience at least unsatisfactoriness. But if, if, if we're stress. going, the, the, mm-hmm. where I kind of wanted to work sure. with it, which we have for the Gospels as well, there's mm-hmm. a saying where, where Jesus, this rich guy, comes to him and says, I'll give yes. away all my money, all these kind of things. And he still says, the eye of the needle is still too too narrow for you. You will still not be able to go through. Why is that? Why is it that rich people, mm-hmm. not to put it that way, mm-hmm. but the ones on top of the hierarchy, why is it more difficult for them to reach enlightenment? Because we need suffering. We need the crisis. We need the, what molds us. What what like being in in this fiery place, not hell, not hellish sure. conditions. But we need to be yeah. in a situation where we are confronted with constantly. Yeah. That life is unsatisfactory. That that no matter what, we can't get a full stomach. We can't. We go to sleep tired. We are always being beaten. We're always this and that, whatever. So we're in this constant psychological grinding machine. Yeah. Yeah. That where there are larger potential for transformation. Whereas if you're on the top end of everything, you get served for you, and you have access to whatever. Then these then. And I think, yeah. sorry, you kind of know where I'm going, but sure. the idea is then why did the Buddha then leave the castle? Because perhaps he knew yeah. that if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to adhere to the, the, the inner teachers that he probably already had the time, I need to be out there in the grinding machine. Yeah. I need to be where pain is felt. I need to be where the, the, the gurus are teaching the, the, the commoners how to deal with their physical pain. I need to be out there with the sages that teaches me the ancient wisdom of the ones that have gone before us. I need to be in the forest so I can feel the nature spirits, the divas. I need to be out there. He started as a seeker after truth. Yeah. And the truth is, the, the Four Noble Truth, that suffering does you know, it does exist or the people experience suffering while the people in the castle, they want to hide from it, pretend it doesn't exist, covered up with more sense pleasures, right? And that said, not even a mountain of gold or a rain of gold would be enough. Yeah. There's never, you know, they always more and more and more and more. And yeah. so when, so that kind of blinds them to the truth of how actually uh, unsatisfactory that is. Mm. They're just t- totally caught up in that. So the, yeah, that's, yeah, it's a very good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of just what. Yeah. I'm, so we are, we're still talking about when when mm-hmm. he said that, yeah he was teaching the different people in mm-hmm. different ways mm-hmm. and and I for me and I know I'm I'm constantly conflating it with with Christianity or the perception. No, it's of a it's a good re- reality because you're drawing on that teaching system to understand this type and of and that might approach. be completely yeah. wrong. Well, it could be. But, it could be even more yeah. right than than we know of. So I don't know. <laughs> and then of course this this intuitive what yes. I remember what I was experiencing yeah. as being that Buddhist monk when I had yes. that re 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 remembering sure. so to speak. Yeah, is, let, yeah. Let, let's. 
well, then let's talk about that for a little bit if you'd like to, whatever you'd like to say about that. Let me preface it with a little bit of um, this kind of paradox of, so it, it said on the night of the Buddha's enlightenment, one of the things that stages he went through is recalling his own past lives, mm. incalculable number of past lives, mm. right? And then before going on to actually seeing these, uh, the, the cycles of birth and death in other beings. Mm. So that was the next, but his own past lives. So that, to me, that seems fairly important. Now, the, the, the paradox is some people say, and, and there's wisdom in this too, obviously. Well, I guess some of the, um, the monastic order, they're not allowed to really talk about their past lives for this and that reasons, at least among the lay people that I know of. Now they can talk about the Buddhist past life, or, or I don't know exactly what, but I, you don't hear too many um, uh, uh, monastics talking about that. I won't go into the reasons now, but we're not monastics, so that rule doesn't apply to us. And um, the, the other thing is that you know, some people can get hung up on certain past lives, right? So they can constantly either re-traumatize or get too involved in that and yeah. where where that's uh, they put too much importance on it. But I would say there is a great deal of importance to be gained. So what is the balanced approach to look at these types mm. of things? And then you can also do this from um, draw on your own experience with past life memories too, right? As experiential. Yeah. Yes, because Mem- all of all memory, the things you yep. said there, mm-hmm. absol- absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I will give more kind of my approach to this mm-hmm. more than what others have sure. put. Because in, in the inner work I've been doing where I work with timelines and clearing of timelines using the chiasm of my heart feel, so that's a completely different approach. Mm-hmm. But when I go in, in, in this life alone, I work through many of my fields that are part of my energy system. And when once I'm done with the field, it collapses. And once it collapses, you see everything that is on the timelines connected to that field. That that would be how I would interpret that as the Buddha went through these enlightenment stages, he would collapse his scanners or his fields, and there he would see all the existences he had been on with that field on these timelines, as I would put it. Because the experience I have had is that once that happens, I see all the timelines collapse, but they they surface as these had this life and a kind of past life that just as in time of death, they you just go through all of them as they cease to exist on the timeline. They they surface, activate, evaporate, and then what you are pulling out of that is that whatever remains there of viability, what's called viability rate that goes with consciousness units, will then be transferred into my heart field. Mm-hmm. And then activate that to another ring of expansion, another ring of of developmental processes that will lead to new timelines. But whenever I'm done with a field and it no longer is useful for me for my continued journey of expansion, it will collapse and everything that's on it will collapse with it. And by that, all of these past lives would cease to exist. And even if you ask me, can you remember them? No, they will completely cease to exist. So that's another way of getting unhooked of the wheel of samsara, where you work with the different developmental processes of your fields, lifting them to their highest energy state and highest viability rate, as it's called, where you then will understand this is lifting it up to its highest potentials from where all of the other timelines that is below that will cease to exist. So thereby, there's no need to talk about it because it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it ceases to exist completely. So that's also cessation of pain mm-hmm. and cessation of, of rebirth and cessation of suffering because you have cleared yourself to that level where everything literally becomes light and symbols, mm-hmm. to put that one in there. And with that, collapse everything that's below that, that is lesser than that. So, so that's how I kind of perceive that thing. So, but with things that lingers on, as yes. in this, the Buddhist monk, that's because I'm not done with it yet. Wow. I still have got some frustration there because I died in agony and torture and severe pain. And some of the things that I experienced there where I was using all of my techniques first to try and transform in compassion, which didn't work because I was dealing with some really severe, uh, let's just call it type of being that were in human form there. So that didn't work. Then I went to other ways in while I was being tortured, while I was in severe agony and completely bodily pain, but I could administer that. But what frustrated me was that I kind of felt in that moment that all of my techniques didn't apply. So, so, so that, that's the frustration. And that's why sometimes when I work with the whole idea of Buddhism, I can go in between this, this high state of compassion and understanding and transformation and, and it brings me joy. And then the next moment, because of that frustration of in the moment of death, where I try to, none of this works. And eventually the only thing I could do was to pull myself into the void. 
But that has not really ended that timeline. It's not, it, it, there's still pain, there's still this image of that being, what was that being, what was going on, the whole frustration around that. So, so that there's still pain there, so that's why it's not ended. So when, when you're in that state of a past life, that's also when we talk the monastic level as a monk, it's good not to talk about it because you will then, you will then activate it further. You will, you will go in with your human mind. Once you try to verbalize things, you will go in with the human mind and create thought forms and ideas and by that actually amplify the narrative around it, amplify the experience other than just having it as an experience. So it should be done in contemplation and inner work and compassion work that goes with my relative reality and why why it for me led to frustration. What was it of the teachings that I might have inter- misinterpreted so that it didn't apply to that situation and, and thereby it would be logical to think, oh, perhaps my teachers didn't teach it right. I would go into this whole kind of spinning off as their fault or was the Buddha fake or <laughs> what have you and then put it back into the center point and say, okay, not as in why did I have that experience or why was it put in, it was a political issues and the things I was involved with in the time and all these kind of circumstances in 1959 in China. So we kind of get the context of that. So why why was it that it's unfinished for me? That would be the, the, the point of inquiry where I go in and look at that in meditation as I've done in, of, with a past life in, as a Native American. And what was it that I didn't get done that keeps me stuck on that timeline. So that's that's where the way we work with past lives, but we don't share it, because that is that is so relative that when we talk about the Buddhist ideas, you only share what's relevant for the group. You don't share what's relevant for you. So you keep what's yours, yes. because that's your process. But you share what's relevant for the group as a as a community to lift up as an enlightened group that lifts the group to a higher level, not your personal distress or what have you, because that's yours to deal with. Duh, you t- you are practicing compassion and undo of 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 pain yeah. and suffering. Yeah. So you don't share that. Yeah, very beautiful and wisely put. And the Buddha would do that too. And in crowds, he would kind of survey the crowd and just know exactly what to say, what not to say for everyone present there, mm-hmm. right? And, um, but this, this uh, what I'm, what comes to mind now is it, besides the, yeah, the pain and the challenge behind uh, what I, what I felt by hearing you say that it, is that I wonder if, um, if there's other past lives behind that, mm. that interrelate to that moment too, if there, if there's patterns in past lives too, Probably. yeah, that can, that, uh, that either repeat or that are significant and, yeah, so it's uh, it's it's it's, it's, it's it, the way you viewed that in your response to it. It's it's uh, I think it's I, f- I find it very helpful, uh, especially for practitioners that are getting around that level. And I would love to hear from some practitioners who are experiencing past life recall. And I know I've done a post in the past about what makes it even more confusing is all the different. Uh, potentials where it could not be a past life it could actually be something else right Mm -hmm. there's so many other possibilities where what one is experiencing uh could seem like a past life but there's so many other explanations of what it could be too yeah Yeah. so yeah maybe i can refer people to that post because i I can see where randy could just go on for probably a couple days with that one at least (laughs) so so that's a whole other level so now i want to keep it with the whole buddhist and you can kind of say well if if you're not supposed to share this as as Mm -hmm. as a monk because you didn't share the frustration Mm -hmm. yes yes Absolutely, yeah. Dylan, you noted here, yes, I should not have shared it. But since no, I'm no. not, I'm not a monk. Yeah, exactly. And I'm using yes. this as an example of, okay, because I'm working with past lives yes. as well. Mm-hmm. And we are getting into when we talk about the elevation of our reality on its, mm-hmm. on its own yes. merits and what that is and what that means. Mm-hmm. Then as part of the universal structures, the whole clearing of past lives come in and we need techniques to yes, do that. Absolutely. Well, first, I, I feel we need techniques and able to access them mm-hmm. and recall them because, you know, it's obviously valued within Buddhist teachings of past life recall, right? Mm-hmm. Then we need ways to uh, how to go about experiencing them, viewing them, mm-hmm. and then how we, how and when we should share them to who, mm-hmm. you know, because they're important and they're, um, some parts are taboo, some parts are not. And I mm-hmm. think 
think, uh, and then some people write it off altogether. And I don't think, that, so you'll have these, um, if I might do a slight gripe, you have some psychologists mm-hmm. that find all the brilliance of the Buddhist teachings in, in psychology. But if someone's that brilliant and they're talking about path, they just completely disregard yeah, yeah. that. Like, oh, that's just fairy tale. Well, I don't think it would be in there for, for no reason whatsoever, mm-hmm. right? So it's, it is a complex issue that I feel needs to be explored. And because we're not subject to monastic rules, you know, and I would also invite monastics to, uh, to come in here and uh, also um, uh, give advice on how lay practitioners mm-hmm. might experience these things too, right? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I want to put in there sure. when we talk about all of these ancient teachers that's mm-hmm. been there in my understanding and the way I see it and, and recall it from mm-hmm. my lives mm-hmm. here and there and beyond is that you have the teacher that's always kind of the center point of this teaching system mm-hmm. that is not channeling, yes. that is not downloading. It is it's given off over by the ones that gone before this is kind of you have a field of knowledge you have a field of consciousness you have a field of that is divided into a kind of hierarchical structure of different beings which goes into the buddhist cosmology as well and all of this is is triggered what you call trickle down it, it yeah. spills over down to the deeper layers mm-hmm. until there is a human representative that becomes the the face of that system that becomes the interpreter of that system that is born into different realms that is what the 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 esoteric calls avatars and you have other ideas of the 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 rebirth are hearts or whatever it is there's always one the teachers that comes in in different crises and different times in human history and teach these different concepts within different i call them factions extraterrestrials what have you that's where i go in a little bit out of the normal understanding of buddhist teachings mm-hmm. But there are always these teachers. And the way they operate, the dynamics are more or less the same. You have the teacher that comes in, whether it's poor or it's rich or whatever it is, then that person begins to create the people around him or her. We haven't heard many of the female teachers, but there have been a few. Sure. And they create, they have the first one that is the second ring that where they have this, this inner circle of people around them that are in their, the field of the teacher where they, like osmosis, get the teachings directly mm-hmm. delivered to them. And they, they are always connected through past lives. They're always doing the same thing. They're circulating to do that. So they they are appointed that position always. So they are called the igniters and the administrators, and it will not go further into exploring that. Mm-hmm. And then we have the third cycle where we begin to have the ones that are preaching what that's the kind of the monastic, the, the, the teachers of the monastery, the teachers of the monk, the high level of that one, which I have no English word for that. I just call it the grandmaster. And then you have the monks that are part of that section, but the monks go into the fourth ring as well. Mm-hmm. So the teachings would there be a different type of teaching. And then you have the fifth ring, which are the laymen or the commoners that are inside reality. And if you ask me, would the Buddha teach the layman the fifth ring about reincarnation? Absolutely not. That's the monastic. That's for the monks. Yeah, to do to do but the teachers of the monks they would know about these past life because they were recalled it they would not be taught it they were recalled it automatically because they're so close to the second ring where they would also get a spillover not osmosis in the same way as from the teacher but they would get a spillover that would ignite enough for them to run a monastery to to do the daily chores to do we wake up we do this we have this discipline we have this way of living and we're working with this to nullify the effects of physical existence within the monastery. We're working that way with energy like Feng Shui or with the garden or with uh, growing of herbs or whatever it was so that we transform the, the monastery setting, if there's a word monastery, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, the, the grounds of the monastery. Exactly, yeah. to mm-hmm. keep that pristine. So it represents Shambhala on earth, actually. Mm-hmm. So that's what the monastery is. And the Shambhala is a kind of heavenly realm where the hearts and the, the enlightened ones or whoever, and it's a huge, mm-hmm. which we know from Tib- Tib- Tibetan uh, um, Buddhism, there are many different realms there and, and we're not to go in there either. So, so all of this is the understanding. Well, you would say, well, the Buddha didn't have a monastery. He didn't have monks. He, they came later as far as I understand, right? 
Well, but I, yeah. I don't think that. I think he did have yeah. the. He might not have called them monks. He right. did not have the monastery, as the early Christians didn't have a church. But they have the ecclesias. They had the gatherings. They yeah. met in specific parks, meadows means, and yeah. parks yes. and and what have yeah. you. As the, the, you know the. The, the and sorry about the, sure. the I'm going into Greek philosophers they uh-huh. also the Stoics they met under the stolers they met under the pillars where they were discussing topics yeah. so, so that's how it was so of course he had his people around him of sure. course yes and he had uh, and this goes to um, was the chief disciple I guess or I mean whatever is interpreted the, yeah. the close ring of monks that are well known and uh, what was it Sariputta was foremost in wisdom and there are I think accounts of Sariputta doing his own teachings to his own I um, I don't know if anyone else noticed, but when Randy talked about the third ring, you actually said cycle for third one. So I'm, I, I, you meant third ring, but yeah. it just came out. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, no, 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 that's that just wanted to point that out in case anybody else noticed it or was confused about it. But yeah, it's, 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 um, it, it makes a lot of sense, uh, to, to see that, that system as yeah. well. And, and yeah. we're seeing that mirrored yeah. actually when you do educational institutions, yes. you have the podium and then you have the seats that are divided into rings or the theater where you have the rings mm-hmm. again and or yeah. as well with the yeah. ones in the back are the ones that are in the cheap seats. Sure, because you have the serious practitioners yeah. closer to the, yeah, and the yes. ones that are close, and the, the past life connection is really interesting yes. as well, because yeah. there's stories in the suttas where um, it was uh, Mogalana and, uh, was it, uh, Anna, uh, no, I think it was, was it, no, it was, it was, two, well, Sariputta and whoever he was with, either Mogalana or um, Anaruda or whichever one he's paired up with, but they supposedly went through many past lives together and there's like this uh Bert and Ernie type care oh I don't know but you know they they were always kind of known together and so yeah that that yeah. makes sense like that as well yeah, yeah. they yeah. will always find each other no matter where they were they will wild. always be drawn together because if there is to be a teacher seated into mm-hmm. reality and create the five rings of knowledge mm-hmm. to create the waves of different levels of ignition mm-hmm. of the original teachings within humanity so they can, they can do the elevation because it always comes in when we are on a threshold to a new age, yep. then the teachers come in. And that's what they say. It's he's it, it was it, the time was ripe for him exactly. to be here at that time. All exactly. the different conditions were perfect for yeah. it, or so not he, perfect, but so ripe he was for it. Yeah. he was to end an age mm-hmm. and in, ignite another age. age. So he's an igniter, yeah. and that's what the teachers often are. But that's also why he says that everything that I leave behind must cease to exist, because the point of me being here is not that I become a religion, that I become mm-hmm. something you worship. Yeah, exactly. The point of me being here is to end. Yeah. Everything and, that I brought with me. And this goes to the Buddha's last words, which may or may not have to come another time because we were ready an hour into this. And uh, there was, I think, one other point that I wanted to make that, oh, now I forget. So not not a smooth ending, but I think we, we can probably leave well, it at the, that. The ending now, yeah. was that he mm-hmm. said to his students that... Yeah. that Go out, be the lamps of your own. Go out and, and carry on my teachings as the Buddha, the, the teaching of Jesus is as well. He says, I will cease to exist, but the, 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 the Spirit, the, the yeah. Holy Ghost will come and enlighten you and you will then carry the teachings on. And the, for me, the Buddha did the same thing at his end of whatever happened sure. in the last hours of his, he was having these people mm-hmm. around him. He was talking to different people on different levels, saying different things to each and one of them deliberately mm-hmm. so that they would not come up mm-hmm. with this great teaching teaching system Mm -hmm. and that's why when we talk about the 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 whole practitioner of buddhism today Mm -hmm. for me it's kind of that's not what he asked Mm -hmm. he asked people to not make it into a religion he he asked them not to make it into a teaching system that's right so like well now i remember what i wanted to say that what you were talking about here is just this realm so the, in the Buddhism acknowledges many, many, or, I'm sorry, world systems. That's mm-hmm. what they, that's translated. So that's just this world system, that Buddha for this world system, when yeah. there's so many different exactly. world systems and things going on. So, and yeah. And so I think the, one of the interpretations of the last words, I was looking into this, if I'm getting this right, um, uh, compounded uh, conditions are subject to change. Work out um, your own, lib- work out your own liberate 
your, <laughs> I'm getting excited here. Your own liberation with diligence. That's are, are along these lines, right? So it doesn't say, yeah, you know, build huge temples and you worship me. I mean, that's well, of course they don't do that in Buddhism, but <laughs> yeah. they get more Christianity or something. But yeah, he didn't. He he didn't necessarily say you have to rely on me for a teacher anymore. You know, work out your own liberation with yeah. diligence. Yeah. So I mean, it's a little. It's somewhat cryptic, right? But I mean, it's uh, also very wise. Yes, ways, but it, yeah. when we talk about the the, the mm-hmm. ancient wisdom that's been given f- to us from the ones that were before us, mm-hmm. that will always change according to the teachers that are ending an yes. age and beginning a new. Yeah. It will always change. It will mm-hmm. become something else. And the ones that have got the spillover, the osmosis of the teacher, they will carry the torch for a certain period of time. Then they will distinguish, and then the the third ring will carry the torch for a certain amount of time, and then the fourth ring will carry it for a certain amount of time, and then the fifth yes. ring. And once the fifth ring has turned it into a religion, then the teachings will cease to exist, yes. and because they've and solidified, is, they yes, are exactly. no longer li- living yes. words. And this is acknowledged too that the yeah. Dharma is going to die out, yes. and they give these sign points of you know if you see this, then it's the end is near kind of thing. Yeah. Like one of the things, if I'm remembering this right, is when people start losing the ability to do you know deep samadhi and deep samatha practice or concentration. That's not the right translation I like, but when that kind of dies out, then that's a sign that this will die out for this cycle yeah. until the next one, right? Well, there'll be maybe another Buddha or however it works, yeah. right? But that's that, that, that's inbuilt too. That it is yes. gonna go. And the, yep. Once he he ceased to be, be reborn, I am pretty sure about that. So he, oh yeah, the deathless. There's yes. no more rebirth after that. And then yeah. the second ring, they would perhaps be reborn one or two or three mm-hmm. times. Once they are gone, the third ring would be reborn four or five or six mm-hmm. times. So there's this mm-hmm. amplification vector. Mm-hmm. That goes with that as well, yep. and then eventually the ones that the laymen that got the, the lowest level of the teachings, they will they will have been reborn many 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 times. But once they die out too, either by lifting themselves up to the second ring or the third ring or the fourth ring, or just by complete decomposition because they're worn out and they no longer exist, then that's then that yeah. era is done. But he started by collapsing everything that was connected to the teachers he got it from. So that's the most important thing to remember. Yeah, because when it said when he um, achieved awakening, the first, and then he decided to teach out of compassion that the first person that he would that could get it because it was so complex and so subtle and so profound yet uh, and not understandable by mere logic alone to his first meditation teachers, the ones that taught him these profound levels of subtle levels of consciousness, they were already dead though. Yeah. So he wasn't able to teach them. And the other thing, this also lines up a little bit, I'm, I'm taking with the uh, Theravada notions of the stages of enlightenment. You have the stream enter, and I th- was it seven more births? It's the first stage of enlightenment. Then there's a once returner, non returner, and arhat. Yeah, so. Yeah, so. All right. I think that's the that's the way to put, put it. Yes. Yeah. And that's that's the uh, that's the goal to um, to to see and know suffering in order to s- s- see suffering. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Randy. (laughs) You're welcome. Thank you.